Um, it's time for our conversation. Joining me right now is Professor Nasel Kennedy. Uh, she is the Dean Lagos Business School. Prof, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Nancy. Good morning to you again. How is Lagos? Well, so far, so good. Um, we're in the lockdown, as you know, and therefore we're staying indoors. I haven't been out for a couple of weeks now. So at home, it's uh, safe, thankfully. Not everybody has the privilege of being able to social distance. So I don't take it for granted that we're able to do so. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, Prof, okay, let's get started uh, with the interview. And just like uh, I said earlier, uh, for our viewers, uh, what we're looking at today is the impact and the effects of COVID-19 on businesses and um, how uh, they should prepare for perhaps post-COVID-19. Uh, because the way we're seeing it now, this thing is still going to stay with us, not just in Nigeria, but <laughs> the rest of the world. So starting, you see that uh, coronavirus has, is the most serious health crisis we've had uh, in the world, at least in almost a century or at least in a hundred years. It would also be one of the biggest destroyers of jobs, of businesses, of work uh, for people. Uh, we're seeing that individuals and people will be stripped of their businesses, their jobs, their works, they suffer losses, not just losses of even income, but losses of self-esteem at this time, losses of hope. How prepared do you think we were for this? <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I don't think that um, a number of businesses were prepared for what it is that we're experiencing. Even though the whole world had been talking about the COVID-19 situation, and, um, you know, it seemed as if it was getting closer to home. But, you know, at the time the lockdown happened, from my discussions with a number of people in organizations, it appeared to have caught us unawares. Because all of a sudden, businesses found that they had to shut down if they were not um, in sectors that were considered as essential. And therefore, automatically, they were faced with two choices. One was to see how they could continue business working remotely, or if they were ill-prepared for that, to halt business completely. And unfortunately, a large number of businesses, and when I talk about businesses there, uh, you must know that it cuts across both big and small businesses. So for the small and medium enterprises, it appears that they were largely cut on a ways. For some of the large corporations, it appears that there were some measures in place. But I'm not so sure that a comprehensive view of what it takes to ensure business continuity was put in place and perhaps executed, uh, you know, appropriately before this happened. So all of a sudden, we all find that we're working remotely. And therefore, there are issues about the security of being able to work remotely. We adapted tools that perhaps the security hadn't been tested. And then there was now the issue of connectivity of power, all of which were causing disruptions to our ability to serve customers mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. I do believe that the preparation would have been more. I think that, you know, it speaks to the need for us to have, you know, within organizations, business continuity, as well as disaster planning, and perhaps a crisis management team that looks at it, envisages what may happen, given what is happening globally, and then puts in place appropriate mitigation strategies to be able to deal with those. Okay. Uh, Prof, we'll come to that in a bit. Uh, what you've just said, the disruptions, the business continuity plans, crisis management team, and mitigation of, of all this. I'll come to that in a bit. I've written them down so that I don't lose my train of thought too. But let's take a look at the effect. Now that COVID is here, COVID-19 is here, or coronavirus is here, what do you think are the impacts on businesses so far? Because they have, we've seen different impacts on different businesses. Business A may not suffer the same impact business B or C uh, will suffer. And for some, it's been positive. For some, it's been negative. For example, food, if you're in the food business, <laughs> it's positive for you. Everyone is, is, is on a lockdown. Food companies are doing deliveries. The medicines company or pharmaceuticals, even entertainment. Yesterday, I saw the result of Netflix, for example. Netflix, uh, their first quarter, yes, their first quarter result. And in fact, the subscription jumped because a lot of people are now wanting to be entertained at home on their phone. They'll just subscribe. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. The effect on different um, companies is different. You know, the impact is different depending on the sector. But even with the ones that, you know, we consider that, oh, they must be thriving in this circumstance, mm -hmm. 
I think that, you know, they may even be threatened. It is the truth that depending on what part of the value chain you play in the food sector, you may be thriving at this point in time. But not all are thriving. Remember that when we talk about the food, there are the deliveries. But think about hospitality and the hotels, who usually people are restaurants that people would go. Not all of them have things in place to be able to do that. Now, I was happy that, you know, that we're now thinking about the food supply chain. We're faced with a situation in which respective states are closing their borders. And we know that for various many states in the Federation, not all of us are able to produce all that the citizens of that state need to consume. With borders that are closed, how do we ensure food security? So you're right, there's some sectors that are thriving. Entertainment, next week, the other day, I saw that their shared price had exceeded the one of uh, Exxon uh, Mobil as well. Mm -hmm. But then, mm -hmm. when we talk about the leisure, we find that the cinemas are suffering. You know, with the cinemas, they do not have the platform like Netflix to be able to stream there. So you're absolutely correct that, you know, um, the effect is different from different sectors. But nevertheless, I think that across businesses now, we're faced with a number of challenges. The most immediate is the impact of the downturn in consumption patterns, yeah. you know. So for some organizations who are not able to deliver, distribute their products or their services electronically, it means that if their reliance, their business model was on the physical um, coming in, if, you, if I may, of clients into the organization, already those ones were thrown into jeopardy. So we find that we find that, first of all, reduction in consumption patterns. The second is liquidity. You know, to be able to even put in place the technology that you need to work remotely, it's, uh, it takes a lot of resources there. At a point in which immediately there's not money that's coming in there, therefore, how do we deal with that? So for a lot of organizations right now, I think that their concerns are really, you know what, uh, what are the non-essential non activities have been limited? You can't travel, you can't leave your home, you can't go to meetings. But again, we then have to consider what of the non-essential costs? What costs are, you know, important this time? So companies are also facing a decline in revenue depending on the sector as we've spoken about. They are also facing liquidity constraints there. Then the challenge of managing employees. You know, well, everybody is sitting at home right now. You know, when we first, we were prepared, uh, fortunately, and therefore when we first looked at how we were going to do this, we came up with a plan for people to work uh, from home, to log on to timesheets, and to be able to work from nine to five. Fortunately, uh, common sense, if I may, prevails. Somebody said, how feasible is it? We have 40% of our staff that are females. Many of those have young children who are also home at this point in time. How feasible will it be for us to implement a nine to five? Is that possible, given that they're also dealing with their challenges as well? So there are considerations about employee productivity, employee management there. How do you now manage them for performance at this period in time? What sort of leeway can you give to them? And then lastly, companies are then faced with securing the assets. Everybody is walking away from home. Everybody is supposed to stay away from work there. At that period where companies are left, if you like, bare, how do we, what do we put in place to secure the physical assets that are in place? So there's a number of challenges that organizations are all facing now. And we're all just sort of grappling to um, get on top of those situations that we face. Now, what you've just said brings me to the issue of the future of work. Because just like you said, and you mentioned earlier that for you uh, and your staff, you prepared. And I'm asking, how come you prepared perhaps than the rest of the others <laughs> did you have any intel <laughs> that this is going to happen or perhaps you were also watching it like i was watching what was happening in china from last year okay yes so like you we were watching it uh, a, a number of us being you know um, a global school um, a number of us uh, you know typically would go for meetings or conferences and things like that and it appeared to be coming closer home you know so we saw that it had begun from china uh, one week, I was attending some meetings in Egypt. I left Egypt and I returned. And on the Saturday, I returned on the Friday. On Saturday, they said, hey, one case has come. Uh, the next week, we were doing something in Italy. We left and it had come. It just seemed that it was inch, inching closer west and mm -hmm. closer south. And therefore, we looked at it and said, you know what? Let's just be prepared. You know, I always talk about the fact that business is always contextual. And that in a, in a case like Nigeria, we always have to prepare for just in case. 
just in case it happens, what are we going to do? So because that has always been the attitude and the philosophy, we were prepared in that regard. We put in, plans, uh, uh, we put in place the plans to say, if it happens, what are the different scenarios that we're facing now? If the government institutes a lockdown, what are we going to do? Mm. But then we mm. had to come to terms with a number of things there. You know, how do we deploy technology? How can we access our technology remotely? What's security there? So we were, if you like, we just had a head start um, on preparation, which was the reason why immediately this happened. It was almost a seamless um, transition of all classes online. You know, the ones that were face to face before. So, yes, we did have that, um, if you like, head start there. We were not uh, seeing into the crystal ball. We were reading the things that were happening globally and then interpreting them in our context. Now, still, still sticking with what you're saying now, because I really want to get all the myths from what you said. And since you prepared for this, because like you said, you were watching and it was inching closer home. So you needed to take some plans uh, to be able to, to still function even while we are on a shutdown. Are there some things that perhaps have changed? Uh, some mechanisms uh, that you have put in place already. Are there some things that have changed? Are you evolving even while we are on a lockdown or in a shutdown? You understand what I mean? Uh, where yes. all your plans, yes, all your plans that you did initially, are they working as A to Z, not missing any letter? Or are you also changing as the situation is changing? I must say that we're changing. You know, you spoke okay. about the question, which I'm not sure I addressed the last time, about the future of work. And I'll speak to that first before we look at how plans are changing. You know, in the run-up to this COVID-19 situation, say in the last two years or so, uh, the whole world have been, has been talking about the future of work. And in everything that we were talking about, the future of work, basically we're looking at how technology was going to be impacting work, how the use of tools such as artificial intelligence was going to render some jobs redundant. How do we pre prepare for those? how the skills that we have now are not going to be relevant to the future. I'm not so sure that for all of us that were thinking about the future of work and the impact of organizations, we were thinking at all of uh, the fact that we really will be faced with a situation that people cannot even or are precluded from getting to work in the first instance. So all of a sudden, we were thrust into this uh, situation there. Now, um, people are now scr scrambling. We thought, we thought, okay, future of work is for the developed economies in places like Nigeria, before artificial intelligence will gain ground, before we move to full-fledged adoption of technology, it will take a while. All of a sudden, it has come home sooner rather than later. So the plans that we put in place and how they were working, I must say that there were some things that we didn't envisage. I've given an example as to the difficulties of managing employees when they're away from work and also have to contend with uh, family and household responsibilities, be they male or female. That was the one thing. The second was that we are now starting to realize that, look, this thing is going to take a lot, it may take a lot longer uh, to resolve than we envisage. And therefore, our business model, does it have to change? Because our business model is in part based on the traditional um, ways by which people learn, which is they come face to face. So we had a few online programs, but then we had perhaps, let me say, a percentage of 70, 30, 30 online, and then the 70 that were face to face. Now we're now thinking this business model may not work. The second thing that has changed is that with what it is that's happening across sectors, we're seeing increased competitive pressures because of the fact that people are open. People are being in one, on the one hand, they're being more socially responsible. So you find that like in our field in which we're dealing with management education and business education, everybody's offering everything for free online. And therefore, you know, somebody is going to be asking, do I need to pay for this? It means that we have to rethink our business model. So business models are being disrupted. We are facing competitive pressures. And then we're also facing the pressures that are happening in the wider economy on account of the downturn, if you like, of domestic economies, and in fact, the global economy there. So no, we didn't, uh, our you know, planning and foresight didn't extend, if I may, to what it is that we're seeing now, but we've quickly had to get on board to say, you know what, our scenario planning, our scenario analysis has to change. And I expect that that's what most businesses will be doing now. Um, okay, I was also coming to that in the terms of how quickly do you see businesses evolving, especially here in Nigeria? Because um, we would definitely not be on a lockdown forever. 
businesses will have to come back. Uh, people will have to come back to work. It depends on how many people will come back to work because if you take a look at it, um, the m business landscape of Nigeria is made up of so many small businesses. So how quickly do you think that uh, businesses can adapt to the future that coronavirus is putting in our faces? Uh, I was, in fact, when I was ruminating over this since last week, I was saying it seems the gig jobs or the gig works are more secure now. You understand what I mean? <laughs> than perhaps manual or, you know, mm -hmm. labor intensive stuff. They are more mm -hmm. secure now. So how quickly do you think that businesses, because I can imagine what uh, leaders in businesses such as you will be thinking on a daily basis. How quickly are we going to see businesses adapt? You know, um, I don't think that that's going to happen very quickly. Mm. I think that COVID will eventually pass. Perhaps in a couple of months, we'll be able to see a flattening of the curve as they see it. Uh, but the economy, uh, business institutions, as well as social institutions, are going to take years to recover. It's going to take mm -hmm. those institutions will take years to recover. Because it's not so quick to just sort of turn off the tap and then say, do this. There's some things that are going to be permanent changes to businesses, okay? So that's the one, and I'll speak about those, you know, in a short while. Unfortunately, um, we must come to the acceptance of the fact that some businesses will not thrive. Some of them are going to be permanently uh, uh, affected by what it is that's going on. For instance, global travel. I think that whereas global travel will happen uh, for leisure, for business, for things like that, with the use of technology. All of us are asking ourselves, do we really have to go across the world, you know, uh, burning all this carbon and uh, piling up carbon miles in order to go for a meeting while this can happen? Once we're making those de decisions, because it affects our cost within businesses as well, who's been affected? The airlines. Mm -hmm. So we've heard that, oh, Virgin Atlantic in Australia, trouble. This has been... So the unfortunate part is that, you know what, some businesses will not thrive. Mm. Now, in terms of the resilience, it will depend on our preparedness in the first instance. For those of us that were ill-prepared and were just struggling, before we will understand what is going on and adapt new business model, the lockdown has been eased, we're back to business, and we're grappling, do we upturn everything that we have put in place before? How do we go about doing this then? So there are a number of things that I think will change. Uh, with limited non-essential activities, I think that there's going to be an increased focus on limiting non-essential costs. Right now, what companies are looking about to say, you know what, any cost that I'm incurring right now, just as a means to manage cash flow, if it's not going to contribute to increasing my top line, is a non-essential cost at this point in time. By the time you go through weeks and perhaps months of doing that, you are going to be questioning yourself as to whether those costs that you were able to eliminate at this point in time are really essential and whether or not there should be a permanent change in that uh, regard there. The resilience of businesses in Nigeria to be able, and perhaps in many parts of the developing world, to deal, to cope with what's going on and adapt technology, if you like, it's something that um, it also is affected by what's going on on the wider level, systemic, systemic uh, considerations. So whereas all of us think, let's do all of this there, but we're still constrained. We're constrained by connectivity issues. We're constrained by bandwidth there. Those are not under my control. I may very well want to deliver all my classes online. If the students are unable to connect, or if the cost is exorbitant for them to sit at their desk from morning till evening there, how is my business model going to work? What am I going to do? We're going to find that in terms of the health sector, for instance, Telemedicine, that in some parts of Kenya and other parts of the world were being um, already implemented or used there, in a place like Nigeria, it was virtually non-existent there. How fast are we going to be able to adapt to that? How well equipped are the people who are going to be using that? To see? So, you know, it's not something that we can easily just bounce back from. The resilience of organizations and their preparedness there impacts the way that they will survive post-COVID. Mm. Mm. Prof, you know, as we're talking, it seems also that I'm in a class and uh, <laughs> let's see, you know, because a lot of things coming out from what you're saying and I've been writing down a lot of things to ask, you know, um, from what you're saying now, you're in the educational system. You said just before that what you used to do online was like 40 or 30 percent, if, if I got you right. What does it also say, especially for our educational system, because that is also one sector that has been hit. So how should our educational system also evolve? 
before I come to okay. other questions. And accelerate very quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, the unfortunate fact is that um, the large majority of Nigerian children and youth who have to be educated because these are the leaders of tomorrow do not have access to these tools that we're thinking about. So whereas for the private schools, they were already able to offer online teaching, online learning, the vast majority of our population don't go to private schools. They go to those. If we're saying this thing is going to last with us, in some countries we've seen that they've said, for the rest of the school year, schools are closed. They're not opening yeah. there. Are we going to have an, a, a, a population that is losing out on education for one year? I'm happy at steps that uh, um, state governments, like the Lagos state governments, are saying about how they can deliver lessons uh, through the radio. But again, you find that that does not replicate the learning that takes place face to face. But we're constrained. For every child to not be left behind in terms of the education that we see the world moving towards now, they must have access to a gadget or a device that enables them perhaps not even connect life, but to enable them get the material that they need in order for them to go forward there. We find that state governments are already challenged. Indeed, the federal government is already challenged. Before now, we fell far short of the minimum requirements or prescription by the United Nations as to the budget spent on education. They say we must spend at least 15%, the top 20% there. Consistently, at the federal level, we have not been able to meet that. And then a lot of that goes towards the payment of salary. So for us to deliver that education, it's a big problem. State governments, the federal governments are being challenged right now. Even when we deliver through radio, how are they going to be examined? Examinations are the assurance of learning that we have taught and they have learned. Therefore, they should come and display it there. How are we going to do that? That's something that there is no, as we speak, no viable solution has been found in our context. And therefore, if we want to do that, we need to think outside of the government, what can we do? Private sector um, initiatives, if you like, to partner with governments. Many years ago, that happened in Anambara State, you know, under, I think, of Norbi, in which he said, you know what, we can't do this alone. Oh, yeah, let's call the private sector and then let's get together and then see what it is that we can do. So organizations may want to look at it because it is, if you like, a lighting self-interest is that for organizations that we are interested in sustainability as well as the continuity of our business, if we do not invest in educating our future talent pool, we'll be left with no talent to drive it there. So perhaps it's a long-term thing there, but then we need to go there. But I think that one, of, unfortunately, that's one of the uh, sectors that's going to suffer at this point in time. It's only a tiny percentage that can get the education, continue with the education right now. You know, I, I like that we're bringing this part in, into perspective and uh, thank goodness is hitting me and I need to say it, that even, I've been saying it, that we, are, we shouldn't just look at the pandemic, coronavirus, that let's attack it, uh, is health, is health. I know we need to save lives, lives first, but it's also coming with a lot of baggage. A lot of sectors will be had, had hit. But mm -hmm. the, the, the next question is, and why I also said that is so that the government will have a holistic plan, a wholesome approach to all of this. You know, as we are fighting coronavirus outbreak from it uh, not to be spread further than it is right now, we should also look at a whole lot of things that would be affected. I'm happy that the Minister of Agriculture is talking now concerning food supply because now they've seen that it's going to hit home, you know. So even after coronavirus is gone, just like you said, this thing will be with us. The effect will be with us in like a year, two years or even more than that. Uh, but let me also ask this question regarding also the future of work. Are there like opportuni uh, opportunities that are definitely inherent in around businesses can take? Bis I know a lot of Nigerians have small businesses. You know, are there some opportunities that can come out, sprout out of this crisis? Because like you say, don't waste an, a crisis. There's an opportunity yeah. in every crisis. Absolutely. There's certainly a lot of opportunities that can come. Some of the opportunities will benefit some sectors more. Uh, the digital sector, for instance, with technology, with, uh, you know, in the past, Africa, we used to be, if you like, adapters of technology. So we'll see something that's working elsewhere, then we'll bring it and then copy it and say, how can we make it work in this day? But we must recognize that copy and paste does not always work, especially in our context. The peculiarities of our environment suggest 
that we need to have homegrown solutions. So already I'm very happy that a lot of tech startups are starting to look at, you know what, what are these homegrown uh, solutions that we need right now. So um, in that regard, we'll find that with those sectors, they are thriving. For a lot of other businesses looking at the opportunities, you know, this is the time for us to see about how we can spur innovation and creativity. And uh, she's a friend of mine, and uh, she's a dressmaker. Um, she designs uh, clothes and she sells clothes there. And we're talking about this. She's a small uh, business owner as well. On account of what it is that's going on right now, her staff are away from work. And she says, you know what, there's no way I can pay them or even say, let me take a salary course right now. I just can't afford it because we're not making any money. And so I was asking her the question, which is it that I think that, you know, uh, leads me to the point that I want to make to say, you know what, but even post COVID, what is going to happen? Do you envisage that people will still be coming to make clothes to go to functions? I think that socially a lot will change on account yeah. of COVID. Yeah. Before yeah. we will find people gathering for parties, it's going to take a long yeah. time. Therefore, people are not going to be needing clothes. But you are in the garden. Even the event event. managers, all the, it's, you know. The whole hospitality yeah. sector, all the waiters, the stewards, the comedians, the all of those ones there, you know, everything, that hospitality, leisure, all of that is gone. So I said to her, you know what, this is the time for you to get creative and be thinking, to say, okay, what you deal with is that you work with fabrics. Give yourself time to reflect and then think. In the realm within which I operate, what is going to be needed in the fabric business or sector, if you like, that people will need going forward? Because clothes are good to have, nice to have, but if people are not going anywhere, they're not going to have them. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy because she called me back. This conversation was her two days ago. She called me yesterday and she said to me, oh, guess what? She said, well, she said, I'm not making masks. You heard the, the government say that we need to come up there. So right now, and then we started to talk about pricing. So the two things, the opportunities um, lie in innovation and creativity of businesses. It is no longer business as usual. Sure, so sure. we need to think, you know, this is the way things are going now. What is essential? People are going to be focusing on essential. Mm -hmm. It's not nice to have. The income brackets that can cater or, you know, buy the nice to have there is 10% of the population. The rest for essential to put on their creative, innovate and to put on their creative thinking to see what to do. Okay, Prof, we'll take a break now. And when we come back from the break, we'll be talking about protection of businesses and how businesses can be resilient at this time. And even post-COVID, we'll be looking at the post-COVID economy, how uh, it would uh, look like. That is when we return from the break. At this break, we're bringing you back the interview I had with uh, the World Bank country uh, representative for Nigeria, Shuhab, Shubham Shadure. I did ask him a question about, are we going to be seeing some kind of debt service relief from the World Bank? Because like I said a few days ago on the show, I saw a lot of things in the media, okay, why is IMF not giving us break or debt relief? And I clarified it here on the program. We're not on an IMF program. We're not indebted to IMF. So there's nothing to be forgiven. But we are indebted to the World Bank, African Development Bank, to China, to Japan, I think to France and all of that. So just take a listen to uh, his answer when I asked him that. And after that, Prof will be back. An hour. It will be a topic of discussion at the meeting of the World Bank and IMF Development Committee. This is as part of our spring meetings. These are being held virtually. And you will have finance ministers from all around the world. Minister Zainab uh, will be joining that virtually from here. And then after the Development Committee meeting, there's a special meeting of all the uh, African finance ministers organized jointly by the World Bank. Uh, our President David Malpass will be there. Uh, Chris, by the IMF, Kristalina will be there, and the African Union. So, and then uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa from South Africa as the chair will also be there. Uh, Minister Zainab will also be participating, I believe, in that meeting. So this will be very much part of the discussion. Uh, one of the things that we have, uh, I think our institution has made clear, both that, especially the multilateral financial bank, uh, multilateral development banks, like the World Bank, like African Development Bank, uh, our ability to provide concessional finance. I mean, the thing to remember about all of the finance that we provide, the debt, if you like, is that it's highly concessional relative to what Nigeria would be able to borrow in commercial markets, right? 
So our ability to provide that concessional finance also depends on our credit rating. <laughs> and, mm. and, and partly because, you know, and so there's actually our president, David Malpass, issued a, in his remarks to the G20 finance ministers, and then there was a press uh, that, which was released to the press, I think on Wednesday, late Wednesday, uh, he made the point that, look, we want to find all ways of helping that we can. The issue right now is can we think about a debt service moratorium, say, on all the, uh, the debt service that, say, Nigeria or other countries owes to the International Development Association? Can we do that without risking our ability to provide additional financing? So the approach has been to think about, look, what is the net financing that we can provide uh, in this time of need. So part of that, why is it net? Because yes, there are some debt service flows that come back to the World Bank. But on the other hand, we're providing new financing uh, at this time of need. And our focus has been, how do we maximize that net? If by forgiving the debt, if, if by putting a you know, moratorium on debt service, we're all right, that was Shubham Shadwuri, the World Bank cut free rep for Nigeria. My interview with him just a few uh, days ago. Uh, also earlier, if you were watching, uh, the vice president had a meeting with him yesterday talking about the Economic Sustainability Committee. But I want to say at this time that we should also be seeing what policies the government is coming out with concerning the Economic Sustainability Committee. That's been uh, inaugurated, I think, for two weeks now, so that we'll have an idea of what the government is putting together to reposition the economy. That will give us hope that the government is doing something. Okay, Professor Enese Okonedo is still with me, the Dean Lagos Business School. Um, Prof, before the break we were talking, I'm enjoying this conversation, you know. I'm enjoying it very much. In terms of it's like I'm in a class and we're just talking. Or is it I'm in a class or I'm just having tea or, okay, I don't take coffee. Having breakfast with you and we're just gisting. But let's, <laughs> let's continue. Just before the break, I was talking about the protection uh, for businesses at this point. How... How do we think that businesses can uh, be re resilient at this point? I, I read a report from the International Labour Organization and they did forecast that the pandemic would reduce global working hours in the second quarter of this year by 7%, which is equivalent to about 195 million uh, full-time jobs lost. So mil many millions of jobs could be lost permanently in Nigeria. That's what that means. So how can businesses now protect themselves how can they take medium to long-term actions to protect themselves uh just also um, what you were also saying earlier for example in the u.s i had the the governor of new york governor uh como he did say that they can conduct weddings online now so you conduct your wedding online you get the pastor to conduct the wedding online and you get your certificate online why because of this you understand what I mean? So those are businesses that definitely would suffer for a while to come. So what are the medium to long term actions that businesses can take right now to protect themselves? OK, um, thank you. I think that the first and the most important in my view is that we need to each look at our respective business models in our sectors and then say one thing is what we're doing right now to cope with the situation. But then post-COVID, what we're doing now, is it going to be sustainable? Because for some people, you know, you, you know there's a Nigerian term, uh, you know, popularly used in our local parlance that we say, let's manage. You know, I think that that's the bane of a lot of things in Nigeria. But nevertheless, that manage. So for some businesses, they're just saying, let's manage for now. And then after COVID, life will return to normal. I think that the first and most important thing is that we need to come to an understanding that there's a new normal. Yeah. And therefore, what we knew before is not going to be normal. And therefore, we have to re-examine our business models. The first, to say, is this sustainable post-COVID day? Because that new normal does not exist. I'm, I'm sorry, that old normal no longer is being threatened right now. So that's the first. The second thing is that we need to consider whether, you know, when all this was going on, we're speaking about uh, pandemic planning, planning considerations there. But again, every business, whether you are a small business or a large business, you have to look at existing business continuity and disaster recovery strategies there. Therefore, there must be a rapid planning or refreshing of strategies and actions. 
you know, so the first is a realization that there's a new normal. So whatever strategic plan or plan, if you're a small business was in your brain or you're just reading, now is the time to bring it and then look at it in the light of what's going on there to say, you know what, do I need to uh, deal with that? Given the fact that companies, a lot of organizations were caught on our ways with what it was that was going on there, we need to think about, do we have, whether you're a medium or business, sort of like a crisis management team, you know, when this was happening in my organization, we just sort of pulled together key people, the head of technology, the head of HR, and we considered a team, and we considered a team going to happen. You know what, guys? Every day we meet, and then we say what is going to happen. We call them, not only for now, because this is useful for carrying out scenario planning. Then, of course, businesses need to stay close to customers. The, one, the businesses that customers will remember are the ones who were there for them during this time, not the ones that abandoned them and then we find the risk of business customers moving on to your competitors or you come back and you think you're going to woo them. We're in this thing for the long haul mm. and therefore we cannot afford to not be close to our customers at this point in time. And then to be able to be resilient, teleworking. What is going on right now with all of us working remotely there? It's not the ability to connect. It is how the cyber uh, security or the cyber threats could jeopardize your business. If they steal your data, if they compromise your network there, if you know they get hold of your strategy and things like that. So those security measures have to be put in uh, place there. So these are a couple of things that we can uh, look at to say, how do we prepare for the new normal post-COVID? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I wonder what that new normal will be. Not I wonder, you, we've said it, what it will be, but if it will be adequately prepared is another issue. And if our economic environment is conducive enough to prepare for the new normal, that people will not still go back to their old normal, forgetting everything and just taking the risk that I have to look for my daily bread, I have to do all of this. I know you understand me, Prof, but let me also come back to what I put down earlier when you started speaking, talking about disruptions, talking about crisis management team, a business continuity and all of that. Do you also see all of that evolve uh, amid this crisis? You know? I, yes. And, I it, and it's for those that can afford those kind of things, that can put, that all those things come together. You, you understand what I mean? Yes, yes. So I think that what this has heightened is, I'm not really seeing it as an evolution but rather in terms of this business continuity and disaster recovery thing, not really that I see it evolving, which means that it is changing from the form that it was before, but I see it being strengthened in large organizations. And then in smaller organizations, like my friend, the small business owner who runs a, you know, a cloth making thing as well there, this may be the time to say, you know what, even as a small business, I didn't have this there. Are there any networks that I belong to that can help me think through this? Do I need to have a small group of advisors? I don't want to say board, because when we move to say board, that's like medium, we're moving. But across that there, it is more an adaptation and a strengthening of the business continuity plans. For large organizations, I think that more than ever, the board of directors plays a critical role in terms of risk management. That's a responsibility that starts from the top and then comes down. So we need to take that seriously. But guess what? Even for some boards, we were not prepared to work remotely. Things like, how do you approve things? If it's paper we have been using before, how do we now do it now with digital signatures that you had not instituted with tools for you to work remotely there? So I think that these things may have existed. We need to strengthen them. And where they didn't exist, we need to see in what form can this be put in place. Mm. Mm. You, you, you just hit the nail on the head because that was my next uh, question. In fact, I had written down what management processes should be in place right now uh, to contain the economic fallout of this pandemic. So let me rephrase it now, since you talked about boards, uh, because I did also put it down, uh, what the boards will be doing in, time, in, in the time of coronavirus. So what should leadership look like? Leadership through the crisis, okay. changing? Sorry, because say that again. What should leadership look like and what should leaders be doing right now as we are battling coronavirus. And when I mean leadership, I really, you've talked about the boards for companies or businesses that have boards or management. So what I'm saying now is leadership process through this crisis. What should it look like? Because every, most people are leaders in their, own, in, their own, in their own sphere. Yes. So a leader should be able to, I mean, a leader doesn't have 
all the capabilities and it's not the absolute repository of all the knowledge that is required to do business. But I think that one of the most critical roles of a leader is to envision and to get people to envision what is that future that we're going to be. How do we remain relevant with our customers, with our clients, the public there? A leader must be able to um, articulate or put together a team that articulates this vision of who we want to be and how we want to serve people. So again, that's the first thing that I think is, uh, is essential uh, for things. The governance structure it's very important for leadership there. How am I going to come to this realization? Who's going to work with me, think through these things, brainstorm, and have the responsibility uh, to do that? That, again, is something that is, uh, is uh, very critical. Then, of course, with, with the leadership, you know, we need to walk the talk. It's not enough for us to say, oh, you can do this, you can work from home. What of, you know, with ourselves? Are we putting in, you know, what it requires? I think, anyway, we full hardy for any leader today not to be putting that because it's just a question of survival. Really, that's what it is that we're doing right now, survival. Even for the sectors that are thriving, they are faced with reputational risk if because of demand. Let me take the people who provide us with the um, data, those various things there. You know, with all of a sudden, you will say, oh, that's thriving because everybody is demanding data now. But if they're not able to meet the data requirements and they take on more people than their capacity can, it leads to reputational damage. And, and we're already seeing more of that now. In my office this morning, my data was not working and my money is running. I don't want to call the name of the company, but they know themselves. You understand what I'm saying? And it's not just people are even complaining even for mobile data. You put it now. So those companies need to take, take note of that. Exactly, exactly. And I think that for a leader, we should recognize that this COVID-19, it could be the catalyst that will take this evolution of work anywhere in ways that considerably improve opportunities to collaborate, to think, to create, and to connect productively. Mm. That is the most important thing. You know, it's not work anywhere in ways to take advantage of these opportunities by which we can collaborate, we can think. And really, this opens a, a new vista of collaboration there because we are able to reach a larger number of people. Mm -hmm. The leader was, mm -hmm. must work the talk, must be able to envision the future, must be able to constitute a team that works together with him or her to be able to ensure that the company survives in the sustainable future. You know, um, Prof, what else can we say? We've hit all the nails on the head. Though. I think we basically said almost everything concerning how businesses should adapt and how they should pro uh, pr uh, protect themselves post-COVID-19 economy. Just take a look at, was it last week, the virtual meeting of the World Bank and IMF, spring meeting. Normally, we go to Washington. I was supposed to be. We were all looking forward that we'll go to the World Bank IMF meeting this uh, April. But yeah. it's happened virtually. And we all joined virtually. We were asking our questions from wherever we were in the world. And the IMF chief and the World Bank president was answering. So will that continue to happen? Let's see how it goes. Thank you very much, Prof. It's been so nice having this conversation with you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I've been speaking with Prof. Professor, Professor Enesse en Okenodo. My director is in my ears. She's the dean, Lagos Business School. We've been looking about, uh, at how businesses would, uh, you know, protect themselves against this COVID and perhaps some of the key things you should be looking at now in case you're not looking